Tennessee This Week from WATE 6 on your side starts now. Hello and welcome to Tennessee This Week. Good to be with you. I'm Don Hudson. No one is going to get any points for predicting what former President Donald Trump announced last week, that yes, he is running for president again in 2024. Making the announcement speech from his Mar-a-Lago resort in Florida Tuesday, the former president touted accomplishments from the first time he was in office, like pressuring China on foreign policy and trade, and cutting taxes, and laying blame on President Biden for issues ranging from inflation to drugs coming into the country through the southern border to illegal immigration. His vision for the 2024 campaign emphasizing the economy, border security, and American restoration. And then we must build and raise up a legacy that will stand without equal in the entire history of the world. With your help, we will create communities where our children will grow up safe and strong and a nation where they will grow up free, prosperous, and well. We will reestablish the principles of hard work and merit and end the scourge of homelessness that is plaguing our beleaguered Democrat-run cities. We will heal our divisions and bring our people back together through incredible success. We will defend life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We will expand the frontiers of human knowledge and extend the horizons of human achievement. And we will plant our beautiful American flag very soon on the surface of Mars, which I got started. But we need everyone involved. We need everyone's help. We need to look out for one another. We need to be friends. And we need every patriot on board. Because this is not just a campaign. This is a quest to save our country. Talking about... Well, Trump still holds a massive base of support. This announcement isn't necessarily welcomed by some in his own party, the Republican Party. Critics know it a mixed bag of outcomes from candidates that Trump endorsed in the midterms, including a number of high-profile losses. Now, some Republicans aren't taking a wait-and-see approach when it comes to backing Trump or possibly Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Hours before the big reveal, we spoke with UT law professor and political blogger Glenn Reynolds. Everybody was setting up for a red wave, and we really got kind of more like a, a purple puddle, I guess. Um, so, you know, I, I'm disclaiming any pretense to knowing it all. Uh, but what you've got going on in the Republican side uh, is jockeying for position for 2024, mostly. Uh, there is, of course, a large part of the Republican Party that never liked Trump and sees the way the midterms went as a way to get rid of him. Uh, which I doubt will work. He's the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps going and going. Uh, so I, I don't think he, he will uh, bow out. Uh, then there are people who want to be his successor if he doesn't make it or who are willing to run against him in the primaries. Uh, and at this stage, nobody's committed themselves yet, but everybody's sort of trying to prepare the ground. And, um, you know, at, at any given moment in any political party, there are about 100 people who think they have a shot at being the next president and about one or two of them who actually do. Um, but politicians have a lot of confidence in themselves. Uh, so that's going on. Uh, interestingly, on the Democratic side, it's not that different. Uh, there's a big move to get rid of Joe Biden because he's old and doesn't seem to be very with it these days. And in fact, I keep getting Facebook ads from some progressive outfit called Don't Run Joe. <laughs> that are basically want me to sign a petition to uh, convince Joe not to run for re-election or something like that, uh, which I think is sort of funny. And... Um, you know, they're going to have to look at the obvious success to divide, of course, would be Kamala Harris, but she's not very popular uh, either within the party or with voters. But then when you expand beyond her, who knows? Uh, so both parties are kind of going to be in turmoil, I think, for the next year or so before things start to settle out uh, in primaries. A lot of people would have rather seen him reelected in 2020, but now they're like, if we if he runs in 2024, he's going to be pretty old himself, and he doesn't seem to be slowing down that much like Biden has, but that he may be in a couple of years. And even if he's elected, he can't be elected again. So the most Trump can give you is four years in the White House, and then you're back to square one. Whereas if you elect somebody else, and actually anybody else, but people usually talk about Ron DeSantis, you've got a shot at eight years, and eight is twice as many as four, so that's good. Uh, I think there's some people who 
kind of like the idea of Trump pulling a Grover Cleveland, you know, where you get kicked out and then you come back four years later. Uh, but while that, I'm sure it'd be very satisfying to Trump, uh, I think for a lot of Republicans, they want somebody who can carry the standard farther and harder. And I, you know, I know Winsome Sears, who's the Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, kind of said that. She said, look, I'm a Marine. We're, we're trained to think about the mission, not about the people. And I don't think Trump's the guy for the mission now. And I, you're starting to see more people feel that way. And frankly, him coming out of the box after the election, attacking fellow Republicans like uh, Glenn Youngkin or Ron DeSantis, really turned a lot of people off. DeSantis has been functioning uh, as a sort of a shadow president uh, since 2020. I mean, you know, in the British, they have what's called a shadow government, where the opposition party has its own shadow defense minister and shadow everything ready to move in if, if, if parties change. And uh, in a way, Ron DeSantis has sort of been like the shadow president. He's been running a state, one of the biggest states in the country. He ran it. He did COVID. He's done well with his economy. He's done a lot of executive stuff. Uh, and part of that, of course, is to contrast how he's done with how Democrats have done in other states or in the White House. But I think Trump also feels it's, it's a contrast to him. And DeSantis is sort of crystallized as the most likely uh, nominee other than Trump. So Trump is you know, doing what politicians do. He's trying to take him out early. Um, but I, don't, I think it backfired on him. I think that, uh, you know, what Sun Tzu in The Art of War says, attack your enemy where he is weak and you are strong. And coming off a big election when he won a colossal victory and turned Florida red, uh, DeSantis was not weak, and it was a bad time to attack him. The nightmare scenario for Republicans is that he'd pull, pull a Teddy Roosevelt, because you know, that's what Teddy Roosevelt did. Uh, he decided to run for president again. Uh, they nominated uh, somebody else, and he ran as an independent under his bull moose party, and that just went up splitting the vote and putting Woodrow Wilson in the White House, uh, which was not something anybody wanted. And I'm afraid, I think Trump is a lot like Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, Teddy's daughter said he was the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. He had to be the center of attention and everything. And Trump is that way. Uh, and while he was a very formidable guy, he, he had a big ego too, and, and it didn't work out well. Uh, and I could, I, I could easily see Trump doing that and trying a third party run and, and you know, believing like Teddy Roosevelt did that he could pull it off, but I doubt it. It is worth mentioning Trump's former vice president, Mike Pence, announced during an exclusive ABC interview that he, too, is considering running for president. All right, Thursday, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced that she's not running for re-election as leader of the Democratic caucus, which will be in the minority now that Republicans have taken control of the House. Now, Pelosi plans to continue representing her San Francisco Remain district, but noted that, quote, a new day is drawing on the horizon and it will be up to a new generation of leaders. I'm grateful that many are ready and willing to shoulder this awesome responsibility. And I look forward, always forward, to the unfolding story of our nation, a story of light and love, of patriotism and progress, of many becoming one, and always an unfinished mission to make the dreams of today the reality of tomorrow. The moments after that speech also brought a literal example of a lawmaker reaching across the aisle. And the glad handing uh, after that speech, we noticed Congressman Tim Burchett, a Republican, put his hand on Pelosi's back and share a close moment. We can't hear the words that were said between the two, but there were plenty of smiles. We could all see that. Burchett sending out a statement congratulating Pelosi on her career. It goes on to say that statement that although we don't agree on anything, she's always been kind to me, and she'd often ask about my daughter, Isabel, when we'd meet on the House floor. Virtue goes on to say, quote, I have no doubt she'll keep working hard to represent her constituents in San Francisco. All right, it's likely to be another Californian, though, taking up the gavel from Pelosi. Congressman Kevin McCarthy got enough support in a vote on Tuesday to win his party's nomination. The formal vote for speaker comes in January when the new Congress convenes. All right, on the Senate side, the majority of Republicans voted for Senator Mitch McConnell to keep his role as minority leader, despite his clashes at times with former President Trump. Back here at home, Mayor India Kincannon is running for re-election. She announced the decision Wednesday, held her campaign kickoff on Thursday. That's happening even as we tape the show. We have not seen anyone come forward with plans to challenge Kincannon. We'll keep you posted on that. Touting her accomplishments from her first term, the mayor said in a statement, quote, 
We've made meaningful progress, but I believe there is more I can give to this critical effort. Also this week, we heard from Knox County Commissioner Kyle Ward confirming that he has decided to run for chair of the Knox County Republican Party. This news comes less than a week after the current chair of the Knox County Republican Party, Daniel Herrera, announced he would not seek re-election. Okay, our panel of pundits is coming up next. You're watching Tennessee This Week on WAT6 on your side. Welcome back to Tennessee This Week. We're now joined by our panel of political pundits, Courtney Piper, George Corda, and Craig Griffith. Thank you, all three of you, for being with us. Let's Glad talk about a lo local politics first. We'll get into that. Uh, American Ken, uh, she is now one, three years into her term, I guess I should say. A lot of things have happened under term. New police chief focusing on certain things. Homeless may or may not have gotten worse. I, I don't know. But is she going to face any legitimate challenge to be married again if that's what she wants to do? Well, I think the time has passed for a serious candidate to uh, come out and, and take her on uh, to raise money to get the uh, name recognition. So looks to me like uh, she is going to uh, have no opposition. And, and as I've said many times before, the term limit provision that was adopted really just made these offices one eight-year term instead of two four-year terms. So that's that's the way very few people have challenged any person that's been elected in this mid-term period. Well, with, them, with Knoxville being essentially having become a blue city, she'd have to get a, a, an opponent who's a Democrat. And in a, in a in a primary setting now a republican may run but that republican to be have a legitimate shot would either have to ha have enough money to self-fund a campaign or have some deep pocket supporters that could fund that campaign otherwise there's no point it, it the mayor's office in knoxville has become a little bit like the governor's office in tennessee you're almost given a second term because nobody or few people want to go to the expense, the time, the effort, the commitment, the day and night toil that is running for office. And so uh, the likelihood of her getting a candidate who runs against her is not great unless they really want the job and they really got a lot of money. It's also a testament to how well she has led the last three ish years of her of her administration the fact of the matter is if people were really really mad and unhappy with the way the city of knoxville was being run she would get some kind of high profile ch challenger and her most high profile challenger um, potential challenger was larson jay who's on county commission and he declined to uh, put his hat in the ring for the city mayor's race so that ought to tell us something. One, like George said, the city of Knoxville is solidly blue. Republicans got Republicans got their rear ends handed to them the last time we had a, a city election. So that's very telling. And we're not seeing any other credible or high profile candidates emerge at this time. Well, well she also one of the things she did, and because I'm I mentioned this early on, is that she was brand new to the office of being a chief executive and early on she she ran out real fast when the opportunity arose to wave her progressive liberal flag and it didn't it didn't fly so high and she ratcheted that back which i think was to her advantage because what when people aren't hearing things they think everything's going okay Obviously, we had a little bit of a tax increase. I think homeless, we've done several stories here at WAT on homeless issues. There are still some issues there, but even with that, you just don't see anyone that would step up. Well, I don't think that people are, have, have thought that her term in office was such that they should run against her. Right. Uh, well, I mean, on that, case, on that basis, then everybody, I'm assuming my colleagues are saying Bill Lee has done such a marvelous job running the state. That there was no real sense in anybody running against him. Apparently, that's what everyone thought. There was a Morgan. decent challenger to him. <laughs> so. He had a challenger. He had a pretty well-funded, well, you know, very reputable, credible Democratic challenger. So I don't know what you're trying to say. What my 30, point is, thirty-two percent of the Cannon has run the states, has run the city so well that you didn't engender opposition. Then you, by under that principle, then Bill Lee has run the state so well that he didn't 
attract any opposition that was seriously in a position to defeat but him. The he, reality is uh, nobody he, wants to put forward the money and the effort to run against an incumbent when a few years later they can run for an open seat. We'll let Courtney finish here. And, and Tennessee is still quite Republican, so he was on the right party on the right side. There you go. Same thing. I don't think comparing the governor's race to city mayor's race is, race is accurate or similar by any stretch of the imagination. Well, of course it is. Right, well, ah. well, we'll move oh, off here. Shame on me. Uh, Knox County GOP Chair Daniel Herrera says he's not running. Kyle Ward, for the viewers that don't know, Knox County Commissioner, business owner, veteran, is running, and he's saying that he was urged by Mayor Jacobs and Rep, uh, Representative Burchett to do so. Um, is that the right move? Is that the right guy for the right time? Well, Knox County is overwhelmingly Republican. I'm not sure you, you might as well, you know, not fill the position and save the money. Uh, there's outside of the of the Knoxville city limits, you know, you can you can get a Democrat elected if you try. So uh, it's it's a, a position that has no purpose, I think, in this era. Well, the conventional thinking is that in this last election that the Knox County Democratic Party did a better job of organizing than did the Republican Party. And to Craig's point, that's exactly why Republicans cannot sit on their hands and rest on their laurels. They've got to be, they can't just assume, well, you know, it's a red county, so we're going to win all the races. If they do, they're going to wind up losing some that they should win. So I, I think, and Herrera is getting a, a lot of the, a lot of the criticism for not having organized as effectively as did the Democratic side. So I think Republicans are in a position where they want to see a change. Daniel Herrera's leadership of the Republican Party was not great at best. He came under a lot of scrutiny for having the position simply to fund his business interests. So, and he had, he had a horrible track record. So it's no surprise that he is stepping down and it's no surprise that Knox County Republicans tried to recruit somebody else to take his place. All right, well, I'll let that be the last word on that subject. We're gonna take a break when we come back, much more to talk about with our pundits in Washington, Tennessee this week. And we're back with our panel of pundits, Courtney Piper, political contributor, George Quarter, our political analyst, and Craig Griffith, our healthcare analyst. Um, earlier in the show, people saw the interview with a UTK law professor, uh, Lynn Reynolds, about Donald Trump. No reason to rehash what he had to say. Um, scenarios. So I'm just giving you a scenario with Donald Trump, what you think. If he becomes, will he become the GOP candidate? And if so, can he win? If he doesn't, say like DeSantis becomes the candidate, the nominee, will Trump ruin it or support him? And I'm going to start this time with Courtney. <laughs> so this this is going to be an implosion of the Republican Party to the nth degree. Donald Trump is running to have a Donald Trump show on a national stage again. And I don't know if he will get the nomination or not going to get to have the nomination, but he will contribute to extreme dysfunction within the Republican Party. If he does get the nomination, I see the implosion being bigger than than ever because if you've got Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump, you know, going head to head to the, be the final two or the top contenders for that nomination, you know, things are going to get really crazy and really contentious and this is just a giant recipe for the Republican Party to implode. Maybe it'll be a good thing for the Republican Party because moderates will ultimately get, gain control back of the party and not let it be dominated by Donald Trump. But, you know, either way, his entrance into this race just spells major disaster for Republicans. Well, the my, my latest column for the new Sentinel is on this very subject. And the headline is, it's past time for Trump to leave the field. What he's doing, and the way I see it, is he's kind of creating another version of the Tea Party. And that is a, a, a subset within the Republican Party of people who feel if you don't support everything, and by I mean everything, I mean everything in this, in this candidate, then we're not gonna support you. We're not going to support any other Republicans. It's a, it's the circular firing squad. 
kind of mentality. And the, the reality is that Trump, uh, I was in a campaign once, statewide campaign, where there were Republicans running in primary and the National Republican Senatorial Committee endorsed, uh, Mayor Ash actually was the candidate in 1984 against uh, Albert Gore because it was gonna be such a tough race anyway. Tennesseans then kind of had this absurd notion pre-internet and pre-Clinton that Gore was a conservative. And so the Senatorial Committee endorsed Ash early and another Republican got so angry he ran as a third party, not to get elected, but to punish Mayor a Victor Ash and the Republican Party for endorsing early. If Trump doesn't get the nomination, the chances of him running a, in a third party campaign, not to get elected, but to, to get even with the people who didn't support him, I think it's high. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're going to continue to, I think he's gonna get a smaller number than he got in the last election. And I think it's gonna to continue to diminish just like the Tea Party until finally it dissipates. Well, despite losing the popular vote in 2016, and despite losing the popular vote in 2020, and despite uh, losing the Senate in 2022 because some of the poor candidates that were selected, I, I think Donald Trump remains the firebrand of the Republican Party that appeals to the voting base of that party and he will win the nomination. If you look at the primaries, most many I'll of I'll bet you a dinner on it. I'll what? bet you a dinner on it. Okay. That's unless DeSantis decides not to do it because he doesn't want to be involved. And, and in why, like why would DeSantis want to run against someone he knows plays dirty when, as you say, he could wait four years and probably have the field to himself? Because uh, his ego and, won't and allow and, him to wait four years. Uh, well, Politics it, is about ego. Well, if he uh, thinks he can was... win, he'll run. If he doesn't think he can win, he won't run. This uh, is a I numbers know. game and an expensive numbers game. And 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 the base is for Trump now. And how he gets those away from Trump, I don't know. It, it'll well, be I difficult. think Craig, but I, I think, think it's going to be. I think it's going to be Trump and the Republicans and Biden again and the Democrats. I'll go back, back I'll go to see. where we are. Of those two people, obviously, I think we would all agree that DeSantis would be more likely to step aside or step down. But that, again, he would have to see that he couldn't win or whoever else emerges. But that's just the only name that we can really throw out there right now, right? I mean, he I, I don't see Trump stepping down. Well, with what, what DeSantis accomplished, in, Florida had a red wave. When I moved to Florida, when I, when I, I was 18 years old when I could vote in Florida. And I, ha I registered as a Democrat because if you weren't a Democrat, your vote didn't matter in Florida. Mm -hmm. And over time, like in many other places in the country, that's changed somewhat dramatically. And there was a red wave in Florida in this election. So DeSantis' right. stock is high everywhere. That's true. And there are fewer, there are going to be fewer Trump devotees. There are people I've seen who supported Trump and supported Trump. And now we're saying, you know, I'm kind of over it. They're tired of the insults. They're tired of the constant attacks. They're tired of the name calling. And though they agree with him on position, they don't think he can win. Well, Florida is no longer a swing state. It's, yeah. it's solidly Republican. Uh, but again, this sounds like very similar conversations that we had in 2016. Who, who's going to vote for Trump? You know, a lot, a lot, a lot. He, he didn't have the support of, of the uh, the top part of the party. He didn't have support of the major donors. But yet he had the crowds. He had the rallies. He was the hot sauce in an otherwise oatmeal field of candidates for president that captured the imagination of that base. Why don't you mix some hot sauce with uh, breakfast foods I'm going to pull out of there, uh, all that. I, I can't, I wanna, I can't I wanna, top that. I wanna thank, yeah, I want to thank our panel for uh, being here and sharing their time with us. And uh, thank you for watching Tennessee this week. We are off the air for the next couple of weeks, but we will be back in December. So again, thank you for watching. Have a great day and take care. The views of guests on Tennessee This Week are their own and do not represent the views of WATE 6 on your side or Next Star Broadcasting.